Good morning. The first item of business is general questions. Question one has not been lodged. Question two, I call Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported reduction in the number of childminders working in Scotland. Minister Claire Hawhey. The Scottish Government recognises that childminders are an important element of the Scottish childcare sector, offering high quality, unique and flexible experiences of childcare for families. That is why we are supporting an innovative childminder recruitment pilot being led by the Scottish Childminding Association and Partners, aiming to recruit and train more than 100 new childminders in remote and rural areas. With the recruitment of these additional childminders, up to 900 childcare places may be created. And we have also provided targeted financial support to childminders during the pandemic, uh, including issuing over 3,000 grants worth £950 through the Omicron Impact Funds. We will continue to work with our partners to increase the number of childminders in Scotland through the implementation of our Commitment to Childminding Action Plan published in 2021. Stuart McMillan. Uh, I thank the Minister for that reply and I warmly welcome uh, that the Scottish Government's 140 hours policy is saving families on average £5,000 per child uh, a year, but it is also crucial that free early learning and childcare is flexible uh, to meet the needs of parents and that is why the loss of 1,671 childminded businesses in Scotland in the last five years is extremely worrying. Can the Minister therefore outline uh, what further steps the Scottish Government is taking to increase e the ALC workforce? as we will need private and voluntary childcare settings, including childminders, to continue to expand the free funded childcare for children and families. Minister. So, President Officer, we want families to be able to access the flexible, supportive and high quality childcare that childminders can provide, including as part of the funded early learning and childcare entitlement. It was encouraging that the Scottish Childminding Association's 2021 audit showed an annual increase in the number of childminders delivering funded ELC. And we are working with the sector to explore how to encourage more childminders to offer ELC, including identifying opportunities for reducing burdens on childminders that may prevent them from offering ELC. We are also working with the sector to identify the reasons for the decline in childminders, including ensuring the interests of childminding sectors are represented on national forums, such as the Child Care Sector Working Group and the new National Provider Forum. And this helps us to identify where practical support can be provided across the sector. Thank you. I call Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Minister for that question. Can she go further in explaining how the outreach to ch the childminding sector and also the private providers within the ELC is occurring? And um, will she confirm that the correct weight will be given to that evidence? Because there is a crisis in early years, it is getting worse, and as we move into this winter period, particularly with cost of living um, that is hitting businesses, we could see a massive drop in places very quickly. Minister. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to the, the member if, I, if I've misunderstood his question there. In terms of supporting um, uh, ELC and uh, childminding businesses across the piece, um, we are doing that through our national forums by ensuring that there's representation of their uh, representative bodies on our national forums to look at the training and development that we need to ensure that there's a highly skilled workforce right across there and that it is a, um, a workforce that we are able to recruit to and also to retain. If I've misunderstood his question, I'm more than happy to write to him. Beatrice Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Funded ELC entitlement can be used at a childminder's nursery or playgroup, but parental choice is limited by the availability in their area. The value of childminding for children's development should not be ignored, as it has low adult to child ratios and enables children of different ages to learn and play together. What further support can the Scottish Government offer to ensure there is adequate childminding provision across the country, including in Shetland, where there are now only three childminders? Minister. Um, I thank Beatrice Bishop for her question and I, yes, I am very aware of the um, support that we um, are providing to remote and rural communities in terms of accessing child care. We will continue to work with partners and local authorities to understand the needs of our remote and rural and island communities. Um, and these needs will be taken into account as we develop our strategic framework for Scotland's child care profession which will be uh, exploring a range of issues under themes with partners, including recruitment and retention of ELC professionals across Scotland. 
The member Briefly, may also Minister. be um, interested to know that I will be visiting ELC and childminding sectors in uh, remote and rural communities before Christmas to engage with ELC professionals directly to hear from them. Question number three, Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of whether inflation and any possible reductions to public sector spending by the UK Government will impact on prospective capital projects in Midlothian, South Tweeddale and Lauderdale. Minister Tom Arthur. The level of inflation seen over the last few months has been unprecedented in modern times. This combined with increases in the delivery times for materials due to the combined effects of COVID, Brexit and the illegal war in Ukraine is placing significant pressures on budgets and the delivery of infrastructure projects across the country, including those in Midlothian South, Tweed Bank and Lauderdale. This will be reflected within our latest six monthly reporting of capital projects to be published in the coming weeks. Any reduction to our capital budget by the UK Government would exacerbate this situation further. I therefore urge the UK Government to protect and enhance Scotland's capital allocation in the upcoming autumn statement to allow our capital programmes to continue at the required pace. Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much. Thank the Minister. Within Midlothian, South Tweedie and Lauderdale, two projects which spring to mind are the proposed extension of the Borders Railway and the redesign and construction of the Sheriff Hall Roundabout. Can the Minister, and I know the Minister is going to report, can the Minister advise of any specific impact on these as a result of raging inflation falling from the mismanagement of the UK economy by the Conservatives? Yeah. Minister. Uh, despite cuts by the UK Government to Scotland's capital allocation and uncertainty on future allocations, the Scottish Government remains committed to investing in road improvements like the grade separation of Sheriff Hall Roundabout. Transport Scotland continues to progress the proposed scheme through the statutory process. The public inquiry is now scheduled to take place on 30 January 2023 for a period of two weeks. The same is true of our commitment to decarbonise our railway, and decarbonisation of the existing Borders Railway is estimated to commence construction in 2023. Thank you. Question number four, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to ensure that all fire and rescue officers have the appropriate decontamination facilities available to them. Minister Elena Whittam. The safety and well-being of all fire and rescue officers is of utmost importance to the Scottish Government. This year we increased funding to the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service by £9.5 million. Decisions on the allocations of, of its £352.7 million budget is a matter for the SFRS Board and Chief Officer. I am aware that the SFRS has been engaged with the FBU on work to, with Lancaster University for a number of years and its well-established contamination working group has taken actions across all aspects of operations to reduce exposure to harmful contaminants and this includes investment in new fire appliances and fire station facilities. Pauline McNeill. Deciding officer, may I take this opportunity to welcome the new minister to her post. Last week, Professor Anna Sett from the University of Lancashire presented the shocking results to MSPs of her research into the impact of contaminants in firefighters, but showing that UK firefighters are four times more likely to get cancer during their lifetime than the general population, and the World Health Organization classify firefighting as a carcinogenic occupation. Canada, the USA and Poland a presumptive legislation which tracks links between the workplace and exposure to cancer. Can I ask the Minister what action has been taken to ensure that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service protect firefighters? And will the Minister be prepared to discuss with me the possibility of presumptive legislation that we could pursue? Minister. I am aware of the work that has been carried out by Professor Steg, and it is a value contribu and contribution to building the knowledge and understanding of contaminants which could be harmful to firefighters. Um, and I am absolutely happy to meet with the member to discuss this further. Um, I do know that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have implemented enhanced cancer-focused screenings, questions and discussions um, during routine medical assessments. Um, and the Health and the Wellbeing Department continues to provide a service for post-diagnosis support in relation to employees with cancer. So I am very happy to meet with the member to discuss this further. Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer, and I also welcome the new minister to our role. SNP budget cuts could lead to one in four firefighters being axed and one in four fire engines taken off the road. Over half a billion pounds is needed just to bring buildings up to scratch, with 14 stations actually in a dangerous condition. 
in light of these realities, is it not the case that firefighters will be sceptical of whatever decontamination commitments they might hear from the new minister today? Minister. Um, as the member will know, any negotiations um, for pay are done at a UK level and as it stands just now, our budget for the fire service has increased year upon year um, and we are currently not engaged in budget negotiations as yet. Thank you. Question number five, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with its commitment to challenge men's demand for prostitution as part of the Equally Safe strategy. Minister Elena Whittam. We are taking this work forward through a framework for Scotland to challenge men's demand for prostitution and support those with experience of prostitution. To underpin the, fr the framework, we have worked with an expert group of stakeholders to develop fundamental principles which will ensure that equality, human rights and safety are at its heart. Work is progressing well and once finalised, the principles will be adopted and published. In designing the framework, we will reflect the key aims of the equal equally safe strategy and a vision for justice for in Scotland, including how best to effect delivery. Phil Kidd. I thank the new minister for that response. And all SNP Scottish Government administrations have clearly stated uh, that sexual exploitation is a form of violence against women and girls, and that this includes pornography, strip dancing and prostitution. This exploitation can stem from power inequalities, poverty, coercion such as threatening the lives of relatives, abusive relationships that become pimping and sexual trafficking. That whether this be domestic or industrial, international, big upon. Significant work has already been done through the Equally Safe strategy. Can the Minister confirm whether she will meet with the A Model for Scotland campaign before the close of Parliament for recess to hear from the voices of trafficking survivors of how this exploitation can be effectively tackled? Minister. I would first like to take this opportunity to thank the Model for Scotland campaign group for their work in raising awareness of this key issue. I am aware that they have representation on the reference group that has supported the development of the fundamental principles, which, once finalised, will underpin our future framework for Scotland on challenging men's demand for prostitution and supporting those who are experiencing it. I am committed to continuing to work across government, the Scottish Parliament and with stakeholders as our collective approach to tackling prostitution further develops, contributing to our aim to be a society that treats all with kindness, dignity and compassion. This will, of course, include continuing to engage with the Model for Scotland campaign and I look forward to continuing this work with them and I will meet with them and those with lived experience as soon as I can. Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also welcome the Minister to her new role? The Minister may be aware that earlier this year, the City of Edinburgh Council decided to put in place a nil cap as part of the Sexual Entertainment Licence Scheme. Since this decision was taken, the Council has faced challenges, including in court, on its policy. So given that stripping is classified by the Scottish Government under their equally safe policy as violence against women, what support is the Government providing to councils who have taken the decision to put in place a nil cap as part of the licence scheme, but are now being challenged for doing so. Minister. I thank the member for that question. This government provided the new powers to local authorities to specifically make decisions about sexual entertainment venues within their areas just recently, as you've outlined. Um, and I'm committed to make sure that we can take this legislation forward and support local authorities um, on the way. And I will be happy to meet with local authorities to discuss that matter. Ruth McGuire. Thanks, Presiding Officer. In September, Thai and Chinese women who suffered a horrendous ordeal prostituted in brothels across Glasgow saw justice as their traffickers were convicted in the High Court. I'm sure the Minister will join me in commending the bravery of the women testifying against their abusers, the care and professionalism of those who supported them to do that and welcome the convictions. Would she further agree with me that to end the violence of prostitution, we must end the male demand that fuels this cruel trade? Minister. I do, of course, join Ruth Maguire in commending the bravery of any victim of sexual exploitation in coming forward with their experiences. I know how hard this is. And I commend the work across the public sector and the third sector to support them. Any form of sexual exploitation is completely unacceptable, and I'm equally of the view that prostitution cannot be considered in isolation. The developing framework to challenge men's demand for prostitution and support those with um, experience of prostitution will have direct relevance to tackling wider forms of commercial sexual exploitation, including human trafficking. Thank you. Question number six, Marie McNair. 
thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the uptake of hydrogen innovation scheme by private companies since its launch in June 2022. Minister Ivan McKee. Uh, the application window for the Hydrogen Innovation Scheme, which was launched to support innovation in renewable hydrogen production, storage and distribution, closed on 31 October. The scheme received a high level of interest from private companies as well as academic institutions, with over 70 applications received in total. Applications to the fund are currently being processed and successful projects will be announced in the new year. Marie McNair. I thank the Minister for that answer. Residents within my constituency of Clybank and Mogai have approached me with concerns over the application that has been submitted by Peel to build a plastic to hydrogen facility and hydrogen vehicle refilling station in Clybank. The development is proposed to include a thermal conversion plant that will utilise an advanced thermal treatment process involving gasification to convert waste plastic into hydrogen electricity and potentially heat. Many of the concerns raised have been about potential hazards and unknown level of pollution that this may cause. I am on the side of my constituents who have also feel that have not been consulted on this proposal. Does the Minister agree with me that the views of my constituents are of paramount importance when considering this proposal? Minister. Uh, as outlined in our draft hydrogen action plan published last year, our £100 million hydrogen investment programme is targeted at supporting renewable hydrogen production projects only. For the purposes of our hydrogen innovation scheme, we have defined this as hydrogen produced using renewable energy and that is zero carbon at the point of production. Therefore, all applications to the hydrogen innovation scheme will be assessed against their potential environmental, societal and economic impacts. This may include impacts on areas such as carbon emissions reduction, jobs or skills creation, export potential, contribution towards achieving a just transition and the development of the hydrogen economy in Scotland. Question number seven, Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether fatal accident inquiries are fit for purpose. Minister Elena Whittam. We have every confidence in the system that is in place for fatal accident inquiries, and we keep these matters under review in consultation with the Crown Office and continually consider and evaluate whether there are ways in which the system can be improved further. The Crown Office has significantly reformed its processes to reduce the time taken to investigate deaths and, bring, and to bring FAIs to court more quickly. These reforms have already resulted in reductions in the duration of death investigations, and it is expected that they will continue to do so. Parliament considered and modernised the law on FAIs in 2016, and there are currently no plans to revisit the legislation. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Over a year ago, when I asked uh, the uh, question around the entirely avoidable death in custody of our Marshal of the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, he told me improvements have already been made, further improvements are being made, and we will continue to improve the system. So can the Minister tell us what improvements have been made in the past year, what confidence can we have that further improvements are being made, and what exactly is being done to prevent the deaths of those in custody? Minister. I have deep sympathy for the family in this tragic case. However, this is a matter for the Lord Advocate. I would say that there is separate work being carried out, um, as the member has said, in relation to deaths in custody, which are being taken forward. Each death investigation over two years old and every death in custody is carefully managed through the now well-established case management panel process. In addition to the new COVID death investigation team, COPS has recently set up a specialist custody death unit um, to investigate deaths in custody. The Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit has significantly modernised its processes to reduce the time taken to investigate all deaths and to bring FAIs to court more quickly, and a similar project has commenced in relation to the Health and Safety Investigation Unit. The views of a family are always taken into consideration and account when deciding whether or not a discussionary FAI should be held. Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The leading cause of death in custody, sadly, is suicide. I'm particularly concerned about young people in custody. We know that in Cornton Vale, we have one mental health nurse per 25 residents. In Polmont, it's one and I believe 81 residents. I mean, the disparity is quite stark. We're simply not supporting these young people enough, and the suicide rate is far too high, Minister. What are you going to do about it? Minister. 
I would agree that any death in custody needs to be taken seriously, and I do think that we have to pay cognizance to the fact that mental health issues whilst in custody are very important, and I will undertake to do everything I can um, to ensure that we progress on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes general questions. Before we move on to First Minister's questions, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery the Honourable Anthony Rota MP, Speaker of the House of Commons of Canada.